Welcome to Sunday School, our second session in the series. Um, let me go ahead and open with prayer, and then I'll tell you all about what we'll be listening to today. Please join me. Our God and Father in heaven, we thank you that you rise us up and that you bring us to worship you, and that you give an abundance of gifts. One of such is history, and that the men before us, the fathers of the church, that we can rest upon their work, Lord. Pray that we are edified this morning and that we are encouraged in the words of men before us. Bless this day and bless the encouragement given to us through saints before us, Lord. In Christ's name, amen. amen. <clears throat> All right. So today I have a sermon from a Lemuel Haynes. Lemuel Haynes. Uh, was born in 1753 and died in 1833. Uh, born in Connecticut, he did not know his parents, uh, for he was abandoned at five months old. Um, and he was most notable for being the first uh, ordained preacher in North America as well as receiving an honorary master's degree. Uh, notable for the fact that he was black. He was of notable African descent. At five months old, he was taken into the house of David and Elizabeth Rose under indentured servitude. Now, most often than not in modern history, Lemuel Haynes is dug up to serve as a, a piece of propaganda or at least a force for today's arguments. Uh, but indentured servitude, and especially in this case, was actually a loving mercy from David and Elizabeth Rose. Uh, these two were very staunchy Christians. Um, the, the couple raised them up as his own child, as their own child. Uh, Elizabeth particularly loved Lemuel. Uh, Lemuel is often saying, there's a particular quote, that he believes that Elizabeth loves him more than her own children. Living in the Rose homestead, he was uh, seen to by David and Elizabeth, tending to his education and his worship. Um, David would take him to church. David would see that he would read uh, not only scripture, but the proper uh, Christian readings. During his time there at the Rose Homestead, he, he had to digest, to his joy, mind you, he had to digest books from Edwards and Whitfield. And he became known as the Black Puritan. <clears throat> um, he, he had a love for Greek and Latin. And if there was a second love he had outside of the church, it was republicanism. It, he was a federalist through and through. Throughout history, uh, there are moments where he leaves certain churches he serves. And there is much of modern history that would say this is a source in racism. We won't deny that a uh, particular church he served in Connecticut, uh, there was a, a very strong historical president, uh, prejudice at that church that he left over. He only served for several months. But most of his other divisions, particularly with the Vermont church that he preached in, he served there for 30 years. And he left not due to racism or prejudice, uh, but because he became more and more politically charged that people were just sick of his George Washington worship <laughs> and his uh, advocacy for federalism. So he parted ways and served his remaining years at a uh, uh, parish in New York. Now at 21 years of age, his indentured servitude ends. 
and uh, shortly after that, he enlists in the Minutemen. This is in 1775. The Revolutionary War hasn't begun yet. He, um, but shortly after that, it begins. And he serves for a little less than a year. Uh, he marches out, and then in early 1776, he contracts typhus, and he has to leave the battlefront. And he spends uh, the next 10 years at the Rose Homestead. Uh, he's freed from indentured servitude, um, but the Elizabeth and David welcome him back, come and stay with us, and he stays in Granville, um, Massachusetts, until he moves on to serve at one of his churches. He, there in Granville, he meets his wife, Elizabeth Babbitt, a school teacher, and together they have 10 children. And Lemuel is a family man, and notably so for he, unlike some of our speaker or preachers that we'll go through, he doesn't have much of a, a sad story, so to say, as somebody else. We, we spoke about uh, Mueller last week, and Mueller had to bury every one of his family members. And he was alone at the time of his death. Uh, but Haynes lived to 83 years. Oh, 80 years old. And uh, he had family surrounding him. His wife died three years after him. And throughout his life, he would constantly travel all up and down the states. And during this time when he was not home, he would write letters to his children. And these aren't, hi, how are you doing letters. These were more encouraging. Remember to be in the word. Uh, remember what we would teach you. Uh, for Lemuel, he raised his children in a very similar way that David and Rose raised him, which was around the dinner table every night, praying, singing, and studying the Bible. Uh, years after his death, we have letters from some of his sons in correspondence to each other. And uh, one says that, I don't believe I would have faith at all if father hadn't sat with us and read and sang the Psalms every night. And so here we have a, a huge family who can say that their foundation is in the worship that their father took them through. <clears throat> now, he does make some comments about slavery in America. Uh, he only makes one public comment, however, in, the, in a paper where he says that the, the point of the Revolutionary War is for freedom. And slavery to exist after that would be contrary. That's his only statement. He, uh, we find journals later of Lemuel Haynes in 1938 where he writes some of his personal feelings towards it, but they're all theologically bound, uh, stating that through God's providence that God would make all men equal on this earth. Um, which I won't dive too much into how modern historians view him, uh, but he held the theological standings for men of different color uh, before cultural prejudices. <clears throat> Oops. Now, this sermon that I uh, will read to you, Universal Salvation, was read during his time in Vermont. Uh, like I said, he served 30 years there, and he only left due to uh, political differences that uh, he was teaching. Um, this Universal Salvation is such a unique experience. It's one of the, my uh, favorite ones to go back and listen to, not merely because of the subject matter in this sermon, but because of the history that surrounds it. Uh, at this time in history, Arminianism 
and universalism, in fact, are bubbling up and growing. Uh, there are people who are soliciting from church to church, hey, let me debate your pastor. Let me go toe to toe and argue why universal salvation is the truth. Um, and that's very much how this came up. Uh, this sermon was preached in June of 1805 at Rutland West Parish, Vermont. Wow. Say Virginia? Vermont. <clears throat> Haynes is on travel. He's traveling to another church to preach. Um, and in the middle of his transit, he gets a letter uh, that there is a man who's coming to his church to debate him whether he's there or not. Uh, this is a Jose Balo. He's a universal preacher, and again, he, he's soliciting, he's going from church to church, and he really wants to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Lemuel Haynes. And so when Lemuel receives his letter, he turns around and he goes back home. Uh, one, he does want to hear what this man is going to say, but two, he's not going to allow someone to teach in his church when he's not there. Uh, <clears throat> so Lemuel sits and he gets there in time, gets there in time and he listens to Jose uh, pitch universal salvation. And he is asked, is there anything you'd like to say? And so uh, Lemuel says, yeah, actually, I have a few words. Now, as far as history tells us, uh, this was an unprepared sermon in the sense that he didn't, he didn't have a manuscript. He didn't have anything jotted down. He may have like written on the back of a piece of paper a few notes of what he was going to say. But this is what uh, in the preaching world is called extemporaneous preaching. Oops, that's the wrong pin. Some of these are dying. Extemporaneous. As a note. So ex, out, out of, and temporaneous is a longer version of temporal, out of time, no time. This was done on the spot. Extemporaneous preaching can be done with some notes, but for most purposes, this is done without a manuscript. Um, for those who don't know, majority of preaching is done either in two ways. Uh, a full manuscript, everything that you are going to say, you type it out or you write it out in all the letters and details. And the other is bullet points, just points of what you're going to say. Charles Spurgeon is known as a notable extemporaneous preacher, although on the days he was prepared, he had just bullet points. Um, it should be used in care. If you came to a church and you're like, hey, I'm an extemporaneous, extemporaneous preacher, they might say, mm, you've got time, why don't you prepare? <laughs> no, I'm just going to be led by the Spirit. Uh, we don't, we don't want to rest on that alone. We would uh, rather you prepare with the giftings that you're given. Uh, so Lemuel does this on the fly, and it, it's a great experience, especially since it's a response to someone who is teaching universal salvation. For those who don't know, universal salvation is the, uh, is the idea that all people everywhere universally will be saved. Uh, it, it really stretches some verses out of context and atomizes them, such as 2 Peter 3, verse 9, uh, where the Lord is not slow to fulfill some promise as some account with slowness, but it is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. Uh, certainly way out of context and some of the antecedents used there. Um, now, this, one of the reasons I, I really appreciate this is that when, when you get into sermon preparation and you are years into it, you encounter a structure uh, when we're evangelizing, there is uh, creation, 
fall, redemption, glory. I'm following a pattern. For those of you who've been in my class before, when we go through prayer, you can follow the Acts model. Uh, there's always an order to these things. And uh, Lemuel, he's following some portion here. For some of us, this would be intimidating. What am I going to say without like screwing up all my ideas? Uh, but listen to this and see how he comes up with points. I'm just amazed at how he's able to do this. Like perhaps he was writing on a piece of paper, uh, but like the scripture proofs and everything he comes up, it's, it's amazing. And he does all of this without mentioning Jose's name. He, he talks, the full name of this sermon is Universal Salvation, a very ancient doctrine with some account for the life and character of its author. And uh, he doesn't take any swing. Uh, for those curious, after the sermon, uh, Jose accuses Lemuel of giving him an unfair discourse and wants a, a rematch, so to say. And uh, Lemuel doesn't give him the time of day and tells him to be on his way. Um, but with that said, I'm going to read Lemuel Haynes' uh, Universal Salvation. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3 verse 4 And the serpent said unto the woman Yea shall not surely die The holy scriptures are a peculiar fountain of instruction They inform us of the origin of creation Of the primitive state of man Of his fall or apostasy from God It teaches that he was placed in the garden of Eden with full liberty to regale himself with all the delicious fruits that were to be found, except what grew on one tree. If he eat of that, he would surely die, was the declaration of the Most High. Happy were the human pair amidst the delightful paradise, until a certain preacher in his journey came that way and disturbed their peace and tranquility by endeavoring to reverse the prohibition of the Almighty as in our text, ye shall not surely die. We may attend to the character of the preacher, to the doctrines taught, to the hearer addressed, to the medium or instrument of the preaching. First, as to the preacher, I would observe he has many names given him in the sacred writings. The most common is the devil. That is what he, that, uh, that is what he, went under as he disturbed the felicity of our first parents. It is evident from 2 Corinthians 11, verse 3, and many other passages of Scripture. He was once an angel of light and knew better than to preach such doctrine. He did such violence to his own reason. But to be a little more particular, let it be observed. He is an old preacher. He lived more than 1,700 years before Abraham, more than 2,430 years before Moses, 4,004 years before Christ. It is now 5,809 years since he commenced preaching. By this time, he must have been uh, acquired, he must have acquired great skill in the art. He is very cunning an artful preacher. When Elamis, the sorcerer, came to turn away people from the faith, he is said to be full of all subtlety and a child of the devil, not only because he was an enemy to all righteousness, but on account of his carnal cunning and craftiness. He is very laborious, an unwearied preacher. He has been in the ministry almost 6,000 years, and yet his zeal is not in the least diminished. The apostle Peter compares him to a roaring lion, walking about seeking whom he may devour. When God inquired of this persevering preacher, Job 2, 2, from whence came thou? He answered and said, from going to and fro in the earth and walking up and down in it. He is far from being circumscribed with the narrow limits of a town, state, or continent, 
but his haunt and travel is very large and extensive. He is a heterogeneous, that is, complex and mixes preacher, if I may so express myself. He makes use of a Bible when he needs to, as in his sermon to our Savior, Matthew 4, verse 6. He mixes truth with error in order to make it go well or carry out his point in ruining souls. He is a very presumptuous preacher. Notwithstanding God had declared in the most plain and positive terms, thou shalt surely die, or in dying thou shalt die. Yet this audacious wretch had the impudence to confront omnipotence and say, ye shall not surely die. He is a very successful preacher. He draws a great number after him. No preacher can command hearers like him. He was successful with our first parents and with the old world. Noah once preached to those spirits who are now in prison of hell and told them from God that they should surely die. But the preacher came along and declared the contrary. Yea, shall not surely die. The greater part, it seems, believed him and went to destruction. So it was with Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot preached to them, the substance of which was, Up, get ye out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. Genesis 19, verse 14. But this old disclaimer told them, No danger, no danger, ye shall not surely die. To which they generally gave heed, and Lot seemed to them as one who mocked. They believed the universal preacher and were consumed. Agreeable to the declaration of the apostle Jude, Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Secondly, let us attend to the doctrine taught by this preacher. Ye shall not surely die. Bold assertion, without a single argument to support it. The death contained in the threatening was doubtless eternal death, as nothing but this would express God's feelings towards sin or render an infinite atonement necessary. To suppose it to be spiritual death is to blend crime and punishment together. To suppose temporal death is to, cur is to take the curse of the law. Then believers are not delivered from it. According to Galatians 3, verse 13, uh, what Satan meant to preach was that there is no hell and that the wages of sin is not death but eternal life. Thirdly, we shall now take notice of the hearer addressed by the preacher. This we have in the text. And the serpent said unto the woman, that Eve had not so much experience as Adam is evident, and so was not equally able to withstand temptation. This doubtless was the reason why the devil chose her with whom he might hope to be successful. Doubtless, he took his time when she was separated from her husband. That this preacher has had the greatest success in the dark and ignorant parts of the earth is evident. His kingdom is a kingdom of darkness. He is a great enemy to light. St. Paul gives us some account of him in his day. In 2 Timothy 3, verse 6, For of this sort are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women laden with sin, led away with diverse lusts. The same apostle observes in Romans 16, verse 17 and 18. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause divisions and offenses, contrary to the doctrine which ye have learned, and avoid them. For they that are such serve not the Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speech deceive the hearts of the simple. Fourthly, we will look at the instrument or medium made by use of the preacher and will now be considered. This we have in the text. And the serpent said, but how came, oh, and the serpent said, uh, but how came the devil to preach through the serpent? First, 
to save his own character and to better carry out his point. Had the devil came to our first parents personally and unmasked, they would have more easily seen this deception. The reality of a future punishment is at times so clearly impressed on the human mind that even Satan is constrained to own that there is a hell, although at other times he denies it. He does not wish to have it known that he is a liar. Therefore, he conceals himself that he may better accomplish his designs and save his own character. Secondly, the devil is an enemy to all good, to all happiness and excellence. He is opposed to the felicity of the brutes. He took delight in tormenting the swine. The serpent, before he set up preaching universal salvation, was a cunning, beautiful, and happy creature. But now his glory is departed. For the Lord said unto the serpent, Because thou hast done this, thou art cursed above all cattle, and above every beast of the field. Upon thy belly thou shalt go, and dust shalt thou eat all the days of thy life. There is, therefore, a kind of duplicate cunning in the matter. Satan gets the preacher and the hearers also, for both fall into the ditch. Third, another reason why Satan employs instruments in his service is because his empire is large, and he cannot himself be everywhere. And fourthly, he has a large number at his command that love and approve of his work delight in building up his kingdom and stand ready to go at his call. Now, my inferences. First, the devil is not dead, but still lives and is able to preach as well as ever. Yea, he shall not surely die. Second, universal salvation is not a new scheme, but it can boast of its great antiquity. Third, see a reason why it ought to be rejected, because is it, an, it is an ancient devilish doctrine. Fourth, see one reason why it is that Satan is such an enemy to the Bible and to all who preach the gospel because of that injunction. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Fifth, see how hard that Satan exerted himself so much to convince our first parents that there was no hell. Because if the denunciation of the Almighty was true, he would be afraid of them to believe it. Would there be truth in no future punishment, or was it only a temporary evil? Satan would not be so busy in trying to convince men that there is none. It is his nature and his element to lie. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And six, we infer that ministers should not be proud of their preaching. If they preach the true gospel, they only, in substance, repeat Christ's own sermons. But if they preach, yea, shall not surely die, they only make use of the devil's old notes that he delivered almost 6,000 years ago. Seven, it is probable that the doctrine of universal salvation shall still prevail since this preacher is yet alive and not in the least ineffective and every effort against him only enrages him more and more and excites him to new inventions and exertions to build up his cause. To close the subject, as the author of the foregoing discourse has confined himself to wholly the character of Satan, he trusts no one his will himself personally, injured by this short sermon. But should, by, but should any imbibe of degree of friendship for this age divine and think that I have not treated this universal preacher with respect and veneration, which he justly deserves, let them be so kind as to point it out, and I will most cheerfully retract. For it has ever been a maxim with me, render unto all their dues. That is Lemuel Haynes' sermon. Uh, much as today, as what Jose was preaching, uh, the very idea that death, uh, its presence cannot be denied, the goal then is to put it as far away as possible. 
that death doesn't linger, it is somewhere over the hill. Um, our next sermon, if you care to join us, will be Charles Spurgeon, Call to the Depressed. That's our lesson. You're free to leave or talk. I'm going to close in prayer. Father God, uh, we thank you for your word and the men who were inspired by it, and the men who were encouraged by it and preached your word faithfully. We ask you to tender our hearts, that death be a present reminder of the dues uh, for sin, and that every man must pass through it. And for those who have faith in Christ the King, that they may pass through death into life eternal. We ask for this encouragement in your Son's name. Amen.